Just before we get started, I do want to mention another channel that I host. It's called Mega Projects. Mega Projects is a channel all about Mega Projects. It's a channel all about mankind's greatest achievements, where I take a deep look at incredible buildings, projects, structures, and more, whether it's the world's most impressive skyscrapers. We haven't actually done any of those yet, but they're coming up. The International Space Station, done that. Chernobyl sarcophagus, that's also on there. Well, we cover a lot of stuff like that. New videos come out a couple of times a week on Mega Projects, so if you think it could be for you, head on over, link below, and subscribe, and let's get into it. Tucked away in the English country of Yorkshire is a small nine square mile patch of land known colloquially as the Yorkshire Rhubarb Triangle. As the name suggests, the area is famous for producing nearly all of the rhubarb consumed in Britain and at one point produced enough rhubarb to satisfy almost the entire world's demand. Oddly, despite literal centuries of technological advancement being made since the area became known for cultivating the plant, all the rhubarb produced in the triangle is picked by hand by candlelight. Really? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Although rhubarb is synonymous with all things British today, it's extremely delicious. Damn right. The plant is thought to have been grown first somewhere in East Asia, most probably in the mountains of Mongolia. Exceptionally hardy, rhubarb can grow near enough anywhere and thrives in places that lesser plants would die, like the frozen tundra of Siberia or Maine. In addition to this, the plant is notably difficult to kill, making it a great crop because you basically don't have to do anything to it once it's planted in the ground to keep it alive. For this reason, in some regions, it's considered something of a weed as well. Unfortunately, rhubarb grown in this way is somewhat sour, which, coupled with the fact that the plant's leaves are toxic, meant that it actually took many centuries for people to realize that it was actually edible. Things started changing sometime in the 17th century, when enterprising Britons realized that the fleshy stalks of the plant tasted quite nice ice when dipped in sugar, which had recently begun to be imported to the country in mass quantities. Even with this knowledge, however, it would take another century for Britons to begin cultivating the plant for mass culinary purposes, at which point they realized that, well, holy crap, rhubarb is basically the only thing that loves British weather. Specifically, it's noted that rhubarb thrives in cold, wet weather, which, you know, jokey stereotypes aside, is pretty much what the weather is like in Britain for several months of the year. Let's just say most of the year. <laughs> in addition, it's noted that rhubarb grows especially well in nitrogen-rich soil, which is also quite handily found in abundance in Britain. This all brings us to the whole candlelit harvesting thing. At some point, farmers realized that rhubarb's trademark tartness could be eliminated if the plant was grown in the dark at a certain stage, and that the act of doing this actually made the stalks of the plant taste sweet, negating the need for sugar to be added to dishes containing it. With this information in hand, farmers quickly developed and subsequently refined the process for growing rhubarb in the dark. For example, it was eventually realized that rhubarb could be forced to grow by subjecting an immature plant to frost, which nobody had ever really tried before since frost is normally a death sentence for many plants. However, with rhubarb, this merely, as one rhubarb expert notes, makes the rhubarb crown break its winter dormancy and stimulates the conversion of starch stored in the rhubarb crown to glucose. Normally, this glucose is used by the entire plant during growth. However, by putting the rhubarb in total darkness at a certain stage, the leaves of the plant will be anemic and wilted, resulting in all of that delicious glucose being left in the plant's stalk. This is why rhubarb grown in this manner is so much sweeter than rhubarb grown via more traditional means. Naturally, once this was discovered, farmers began growing rhubarb in specially constructed forcing sheds, which were kept in total darkness and kept warm by whatever means was available. Prior to this, the rhubarb was, and still is, just left in a field for around two years to allow the roots to grow while periodically being covered in nitrogen-rich fertilizer. In the 18th century, the fertilizer was mostly manure and something known as shoddy, essentially discarded woolen fibers sourced from wool manufacturers. Today, however, farmers mostly use manure, which, in addition to being cheap and plentiful, stops thieves from stealing the rhubarb. And a fun fact on this one, rhubarb requires no preparation whatsoever to eat, and it's possible to quite literally pull it straight out of the ground and take a bite out of the store. Indeed, the author of this piece, as it says, here, one Carl Smallwood, a fact fiend fame, by the way, check that channel out, who grew up in Yorkshire, can confirm that he and his friends used to do this with rhubarb from a local farmer's field until said farmer started covering them in manure. And I can say personally, my parents grew rhubarb in the garden. I didn't steal it from any farmers, like that thief Carl, but I did eat it in the garden straight from the plants. It was awesome. <laughs> 
In any event, whilst in a forcing shed, rhubarb will grow at an astonishing rate to the point that it is said that you can hear large groups of it growing if you're quiet. During this time, whoever is tasked with checking on the rhubarb will only be allowed to do so by candlelight, since even something like a torch could interfere with the botanical wizardry happening as intended. The same can be said of people tasked with ultimately harvesting the rhubarb, which is done entirely by hand because of the delicate nature of the task. So, where does the Yorkshire rhubarb triangle come into all of this? Well, the county of Yorkshire is noted as having pretty much the perfect conditions for growing rhubarb, and Yorkshire-based farmers very quickly became famous for the quality of their forced rhubarb during the 19th century. As is so often the case, the success of a few farmers encouraged more to grow their rhubarb, and before long there were hundreds of rhubarb farmers dotted across the county. Eventually, Yorkshire became synonymous with rhubarb to such an extent that it's believed that for a brief period in the 20th century, century, Yorkshire produced 90% of the world's winter rhubarb. As for why the area is called the Yorkshire Rhubarb Triangle, that name was coined sometime in the 20th century, when someone noted that the highest density of rhubarb farmers could be found between the cities of Bradford, Leeds, and Wakefield, which, when lines were drawn on a map, formed a crude triangle. Sadly, the size of the triangle has shrunk considerably since then, being comprised of just 9 square miles of land today in comparison to 30 square miles of land that it consisted of during the heyday of rhubarb when big rhubarb was being spearheaded by the lizard people naturally. In recent years, the triangle has been officially recognized as a protected designation of origin, which essentially means that only rhubarb grown within the triangle can advertise itself as true Yorkshire forced rhubarb, similar to the case of champagne grown from the grapes of the Champagne region in France. And I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please do check out that new channel I mentioned right at the top, Mega Projects. It's, uh, I'd love to know what you think. I'll link to it below, and thank you for watching.